welcome to the Myth Vault podcast, where we talk about cryptids, urban legends, folklore, creepypasta, and other fun stuff that may or may not exist. I'm your host, Kathy Carnage, along with my co-host, Weird Musician, and we're going to talk about myths and legends from around the world. And today, we're going to talk about vampires. Now, vampires are pretty interesting because they seem to be one of those common myths that can be found in folklore and legends from around the world. Like, any country you go to has something that has something in common with what we think of when we say vampire. Weird Musician, you said you had some interesting things you found about world folklore on uh, vampires? Yes, legends of vampires have started with cultures such as the Mesopotamians, the Hebrews, Asian Greeks, and Romans, uh, because they have tales of the demonic entities and full of the ring spirits that are considered precursors to modern vampires. Uh, despite the occurrence of vampire-like creatures in these ancient civilizations, their folklore for the entity we know today as the vampire originates exclusively from early 18th century southeastern Europe, well, particularly uh, Transylvania, pretty much. Okay. As, as verbal traditions of many ethnic groups of the region were recorded and polished. Vampires are revenants of evil beings, suicide victims, or witches. Can also be created by a malevolent spirit possessing a corpse or by being beaten by a vampire itself. Wait, a malevolent spirit possessing a corpse? Uh, I didn't know. Yeah, yeah, one of the ideas is that the vampire has no soul, but for whatever reason, the person cannot move on. So it's kind of like a haunting of the body, like a, a bad spirit, like a malevolent spirit possessing a corpse. So like some sort of demon has gotten inside of someone's body and is walking it around and eating people and stuff. That's that's kind of what they mean with that one. So they can they can never be happy pretty much. The one thing that all vampires everywhere have in common are are say they attack people and they eat you know eat their blood they they suck their blood or whatever you want to call it. Sometimes they have different ways of doing it, but every one of them has has a way to attack a person and devour a part of them. And blood itself is kind of symbolic of our life force, of our energy. That's another common concept that you can find in a lot of societies around the world, where blood is, it has a, a mystical property, it's a magical thing, and it's very powerful because that's, that's our life force. Without it, we can't live. So you got that going on, too. I found something interesting here. The word vampire, as we know it today, didn't appear in the English language until 1734. There was an Anglo-Saxon poem that was titled The Vampire of the Fens, but they spelled it V-A-M-P-Y-R-E instead of with an I. You were saying like some of the earliest accounts of vampires can be found in Sumerian and Babylonian myths from 4000 BC, which is quite a long time ago. One of them is the Ekimu or the Edimu. I think I'm pronouncing that right. It's H-E-I-M-M-U or A-D-I-M-M-U. And that is translated as one who is snatched away. The Ekimu is a type of spirit or demon that was not, the person was not buried properly. And they're angry about that. So they've come back to suck the life out of the living, like in revenge. So they're very angry. Do you have any other instances of like really ancient? Um, yeah, I have one from... Mayans, 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 yeah. Mayans, yes. Kama, Kamasots, Kamasots, a, a bad god. Yeah. It, it's called a dead bat in the Quiche language. The bat was associated with night, death, and sacrifice. Kamasots is from, from the Quiche words Kame, meaning death, and Sots, meaning bat. In the Popol Vuh is a corpus of mytho historical narratives of the post classical kingdom in Guatemala's Western Highlands. So, from Guatemala, pretty much. Popo Blue is from Guatemala. Okay. It's a, so, Kamasots are bat-like monsters encountered by the Maya hero twins Hunapu and Svalanke during the, their trials in the underworld of Zibalba. Mm-hmm. The twins have to spend the night in the house of bats where they squeeze themselves into their own Logans in order in order to defend themselves from the circling bats. Hunapu stuck his head out of his blowgun to see if the sun had risen, and Kamasot snatched up his head and carried it to the ball court to be hung up as the ball to be used by the gods in their next ball game. So pretty much they use his head as a ball. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no. in, and it says in part three. 
chapter 5 of the Popol Vuh, a messenger from Zibalba in the form of a man with the wings of a bad broker, oh, oh okay, of a bad brokers a deal between Lord Tohil and promises, wait, and yeah, and, pro, and mankind, sorry, <laughs> wherein mankind promises their armpits and their ways in, in exchange for fire. <laughs> okay, that sounds weird. Yeah, Mayans have some pretty strange myths. I, I'm not too read up on them, but uh, they do have some really weird ones involving, you know, people's body parts and strange things like that. Like, we will give you our armpits and our waist if you give us fire. What? <laughs> okay. Oh, so I found uh, a, a, a very big so sharing them. Okay. Near the Kamazots. Okay. Yeah, it's like this big scary bat thing. Some of the pictures here, they look like how people can think of Dracula looking when he's in the bat form? You know, big monster man bat thing? Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. No. Yeah? Gamma thoughts Batman. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, why? I, I don't know, but whatever. Yeah, they're like were bats. Uh, apparently there's a photo of a person transforming into the monster? Mm -hmm, like a werewolf. Yeah, it's like a, a the transformation, the classic transformation scene. But instead of the person turning into the werewolf, they turn into the were bat. They probably have really bad rabies or something. There, there, there's a picture with one uh, the bat with blood on, on his mouth, I guess. Mhm. Mm yeah, and tearing out people's hearts, and there's a lot of of imagery in in Mayan and Aztec with the hearts and stuff, and and tearing them out because of the human sacrifices they used to do to their gods to try to appease them for various reasons, which is crazy, but, you know, that's just how they were. Yeah. In Mesopotamia, and the uh, they, they had a lot of uh, blood-drinking demon kind of superstitions. The Persians, they think that the Persians are one of the first civilizations to come up with the whole blood-drinking demons at night kind of thing. They found some excavated pottery shards with pictures of creatures attempting to drink blood from men on them. And in Babylonia, there was the Lilithu, which is sounds like it's derived from the word Lilith, which is Hebrew. In some legends, they say that Lilith was the first wife of Adam, and she refused some stuff and didn't want to give him power over her or whatever, and decided to go off on her own, and because of that, she... Um, was considered a demon because she didn't want to obey her husband. And she's often shown as living off of the blood of babies, off of infants, which doesn't sound very nice. Like in the Greeks, they have the Stryges or the Strygoi, and they too would uh, prey on like young babies and mothers at night and drink their blood. Strix or the Stryges, which are like vampire owls. <laughs> vampire, vampire owls. Vampire owls. Birds with long golden beaks, they used to suck the blood of infants with wings that are red, and they have four black legs with clawed feet, and their eyes are yellow and round without pupils. So they're like some crazy kind of sort of mutant owl monster thing. Some legends that I read about the Strix or the Stridges say that there's some sort of witch that could turn into this owl creature, and then they would go and eat people at night. And some of them don't, they just think it's some sort of demon monster. So there's there's a couple different variations on that one. Um, there's the AI. There's an alternate version that says that the legend of Lilith, original, she, she was described as an infertile, beautiful maiden, was believed to be a harlot and a vampire who, after having chosen a lover, would never let him go. Lilith was considered to be an anthropomorphic, barefooted wing or night demon was described as a sexual predator who, yeah, the blood of babies pretty much, again. Other Mesopotamian demons, such as the goddess Lamashtu mm -hmm. and Galu of the Utuke group, are mentioned as having vampiric natures. Lamashtu, Lamashtu. Female demon, monster, is a malevolent goddess or demigoddess. Says that menace women during childbirth and kidnap their children while they were breastfeeding. She would gnaw on their bones and suck their blood, as well as being charged with a number of other evil deeds. She was a daughter of the sky god Anu, and this is from Mesopotamia. Yeah. Hmm. Lamashtu. So Lamashtu is kind of like a, a griffin or, or something like that. So. They had like a lioness's head, but with donkey's teeth and ears, long fingers and fingernails, the feet of a bird with sharp talons, 
and often is depicted as kind of like a griffin or something. So sometimes they're depicted as, as having, you know, four legs, and sometimes it's just standing on hind legs with the hands, like it's a more human shaped. They even came up with incantations and stuff to try to get rid of the Lamash too during childbirth and things like that. You know, back then, they didn't understand the human body and medicine like we do today. So instead of finding a way to numb the pain, they thought if they got rid of the demon that was causing the pain, that it would go away. It's just one of those folklore kind of belief systems. There's another one in Greece. Greece has a couple, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, the, I, 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 I think I heard of the Lamia in, in, but it, it, yeah. it was in a, in a TV show or something. I don't remember. Uh, Lamia has appeared in several different kinds of video games and stuff over the years. There was one in Castlevania, Symphony of the Night, for example. The Lamia is a, is a child-eating demon. She was mistress to the god Zeus, and Hera, being the person that she was, became jealous, because she always became jealous, and... Hera killed all of Lamia's children and transformed her into a monster that hunted and devoured the children of others. Because Hera was just not very nice. Another version has Hera stealing all of Lamia's children, and Lamia goes crazy from grief. She loses her mind and starts stealing and eating other people's kids out of envy. And doing this repeatedly transformed her into a monster. Some depictions have her kind of like a naga, so that means that she has like a serpent tail below the waist, and she's human from the waist up. And that's that's kind of like the, the common depiction that we see in modern artworks and stuff now of Lamia's is having the snake tail. Later on, the folklore kind of evolved and changed, and the Lamia became <clears throat> things that are more closer to vampires and succubi, which are demons that seduce young men and then feed on their blood or devour their souls, depending on who you're talking to. They also say that a couple of people identify Lamia as the mother of the Scylla, or the Scylla. I don't know how to pronounce that word properly, but that's like a sea monster that showed up in the Odyssey. It prevented the guys from getting on their ship and going where they needed to go, so they got waylaid. And I think they ended up on the island of Circe, if I remember right. I could be totally wrong, because it's been a while since I read that. But the Scylla, it was a, a monster that lived in... in um, a narrow channel of water opposite of the Charybdis. So there's two water monsters on either side of the strait. And it was very dangerous to, to go through it. Odysseus in the Odyssey did encounter her and Charybdis in their travels. So I was correct. I'm trying to see if there is a description of what she looked like. But I am not... Yeah, I'm not really finding one. So the pictures that they have is from a, a pottery shard. It's, she's just a maiden that has... A keto's tail and dog's head sprouting from her body. It looks like a serpent tail. So it looks like she has like the human torso, and then in the front there's two dog heads and then dog feet, and then in the back it's like a serpent's tail. This is bizarre stuff. There's one in India called Vitalas? Vitalas, I think? Vitalas. Vitalas? Vitalas, yeah. Okay. A cool like beans that inhabit courses are found in old Sanskrit folklore says that most Betala legends have been compiled in the Vital Pachisi, a story in the Kata Sari Sagara, a tales of King Vikra Matya and his nightly quest to capture an elusive one. The Betala is described as an undead creature who, like the bat, a hands upside down on trees found on cremation grounds and cemeteries, a fishasha, the returned spirits of evildoers or those who died insane also bear vampiric attributes. So apparently people who go crazy in Indian folklore can become vampires. Oh, so that so they associate like mental illness with vampirism. Interesting. I'm seeing if I can find a big bit. Um, well, yeah. I found something, but I don't know if there's there's uh, normal vampires and other stuff, but uh, let's see. Okay, uh, sharing it, I don't know. One of those has to be, but which one? Oh yeah, the older ones on there. A lot of the old images of Indian monsters or demons and stuff, they were shown with their tongues hanging out, which was kind of like um, a nod to how when a person died, their body would blow up and their tongue would blow up and stick out of their, their mouth. So that was like a representation of death and evilness and stuff. So there's one here where it's, it's a, a picture of a very, person with very dark skin and very dark skin face and four arms and they have a weird hat on and stuff and the, the typical flower 
It's not a necklace, like like the thing that you get when you go to a luau in Hawaii, the lei or whatever, kind of like that. There's a word for it. I don't know what, what the proper term for it is in the Indian language. The one that they show here is holding a, a man's head in one of the forearms. And Now we're going on to uh, medieval times and early European guessing. Yes. And this is where Transylvania starts appearing pretty much. Yeah. Yeah, there was kind of a, a big <clears throat> mass hysteria about vampires in the 18th century, which started in 1721 in East Prussia. Supposedly, there was an outbreak of alleged vampire attacks in East Prussia in 1721. And then in uh, 1725 to 1734, it kind of spread ev elsewhere. Like, it just spread out like this big ring, you know, like if you throw a stone in water and it just kind of just concentric rings and spreads out. That's how the legends were spread. There were two cases that were officially recorded that involved the corpses of Pitar Legojevic and Arnold Paole from Serbia. I apologize if I slaughtered that name because I'm not very familiar with pronunciations from that area. Supposedly, Legojevic was reported to have died at the age of 62, but then returned after his death asking his son for food. When his son refused, he was found the next day dead. So they think that he killed his son. Then they think that Blagojevic returned after that and attacked some other neighbors who died from loss of blood. The other case, Arnold Paole, he was a former soldier that became a farmer. And supposedly he was attacked by a vampire a couple years before he died. And after he died, people believed that he had come back and was starting to prey on his neighbors. Like these are written down accounts. So it's things like that where they think, oh, you know, it could very possibly be that one of them appeared to be dead, but was not quite dead. You know, like they had a low pulse or they were not breathing very deeply and they were buried and then exhumed themselves, you know, dug back out of their grave because it would probably wasn't very deep or, you know, whatever. And then they went back home because they're hungry and then people freaked out. It's, it's a possibility, but... You know, on the other hand, you have people saying that everyone's coming back from the dead to bite them. So, the hysteria is referred to as the 18th century vampire controversy. And it kind of went on for a whole generation of people. There was a lot of rural epidemics of vampire attacks. And that caused a lot of superstition to be present in, like, village communities. And people were, were digging up bodies and staking them. I've, I've read things where they would cut off their head, too, so that they couldn't come back. And so they were they're basically desiccating graves because they were so terrified of these things coming back and attacking them and then turning them into vampires and then they would attack somebody else that they were digging people up and, and doing that to bodies. Some scholars think that a lot of this is from, like I said, premature burials or from rabies because rabies will make you attack people and act all crazy. It's a horrible disease. Got some pictures of some exhumed corpses that have been staked and beheaded and things. That's fun. <laughs> yeah, obviously the older the info, the more difficult it is to find uh, mm -hmm. photos or videos. Yeah, I mean, this the, the ones with the two that I mentioned with people's names, I mean, these are they're actually written down. They're quoted events. But what we are missing is part of the picture of, you know, were every word were they really sick? Were they just accidentally buried? Did people think they were dead and then just put them in the ground? Or were were they mentally unfit? Like was there something going on? They could have had some sort of weird, like gotten into like a fungus or something that's growing in the crops that makes them hallucinate and go nuts. There's a couple of those, like in Children of the Corn, the movie, <laughs> and you know and things like that. Those things actually exist. They will actually drive you crazy. So it's there's a lot of stuff that you know. Or an extreme case of narcolepsy? Eh, no. I don't, I've never heard of a narcoleptic just attacking people. Maybe if it's night terrors, they would attack somebody because they, they're still dreaming, but they're moving and they're freaking out and trying to protect themselves and that kind of thing. So they lash out and accidentally hit people. But I've, I've never read anything about someone with night terrors biting somebody and drinking their blood. <laughs> Apparently, all the panic stopped when uh, Empress Maria Teresa of Austria sent her personal physician, Gerhard van Sweeten, to investigate the claims of vampiric entities. He concluded that vampires did not exist in the Empress, uh, did not exist, and the Empress passed laws prohibiting the opening of graves and desecration of bodies. Sounding the end of the vampire epidemics, despite this condemnation, 
the vampire live on in art, in art pretty much, and mm -hmm. in superstition. Mm -hmm. And I guess so, uh, Maria Teresa of Austria. Wow, well, uh, sure. Uh, oh God, uh, I'm sharing a, her article. Another, another, another person with with a big. I I don't know if it's a week or it it, or it was the person was all in one. Oh, that's a week. A yeah. week. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. A lot of the aristocracy from from that time period all wore wigs. And it was all kind of like, for some reason, they liked the white hair, so they would always have wigs that are white. The only people that wore wigs were people who had the money to buy them. So it was kind of like a status symbol. So if you were upper class, if you were um, aristocracy or nobility, you would, you would wear a wig. It's interesting that it took uh, an empress to say, hey, you guys need to cut this crap out because it's not right. <laughs> you know? Yeah, uh, ironic, I guess. Yeah, it's a bit ironic, but, I mean, sometimes you just have to put your foot down and be like, look, guys, you know, I know you're scared, but this is not... What you think it is is not what it is, and you just need to stop. So, I mean, some people were afraid that if you desecrated a grave and you desecrated a body that was buried in consecrated ground, which is buried, you know, on the church graveyard, the cemetery, that in and of itself could cause a demon to come and attack you. Or a ghost will come, the ghost of the person that you, whose grave you desecrated will come and haunt you and give you bad luck. So, you know, it's, it's just like, for, for them to dig up bodies and do that, they had to have been pretty scared. Yeah. I mean, they were terrified. There, there's a lot of <laughs> countries that mention their, wow. Well. Yeah, there's a, there, it's in a lot of countries. There's some in Albania, the Shetriga or the Dampir. Uh, the Dampir is, according to that legend, for every vampire that's born, a vampire is born, and they are the good or the vampires the bad, and they have to go and stop the vampire. Their, their, their whole purpose of being born is to go and kill the vampire. That's what, how, like, the, the vampire thing started. Yeah, they're, they're kind of considered a half-breed. They're not vampires, but they're kind of like Blade, where, you know, um, a vampire and a human got together and had a kid, and they had powers similar to that of vampires, but they didn't have the same weaknesses. According to the folklore here, they did not thirst for blood. They did not suffer, you know, they could go out in sunlight, things like that. Uh. You could spot a child of a vampire because they had untamed dark or black hair and they did not cast a shadow. So if you see someone that has no shadow, it might be a damn tear. <laughs> you better be careful. Blood rain is apparently, when I look up down here, blood rain is there. Yeah. The game was okay, you know. It was fun for when the time it came out. It was pretty neat. There's a lot of uh, the Dampier half vampire, vampire hunter kind of stuff. You know, like I mentioned, Blade. You know, you see it like you know in Underworld, those movies. There's a lot of literature, manga. There's a whole bunch of stuff. Even like in Castlevania, like Symphony of the Night, which I mentioned earlier. You play Alucard, who is the son of Dracula, and he's a Dampier. Same with Vampire Hunter D. He's the son of Dracula and a human, so he's a Dampier too. And he goes out and kills them, and he doesn't have a lot of their weaknesses. Uh, I just, I just, oops, sorry. No, you're fine. I'm just like. I, 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 I just found some pictures of the Striga, I think you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the Striga looks absolutely terrifying. Yeah. Um, they're, they're like some sort of, of ghoul. No eyes, pointy teeth, jagged teeth, you know, skeletal fingers with claws and oh, just all sorts of scary stuff. And it looks mm -hmm. like if they were in some movies where they would just suck out a person's soul. They wouldn't even go for blood. They would just suck out their soul. Yeah. That's a little scary. Ah, mm -hmm. oh, a uh, uh, Jewish tradition, I guess. Uh, Aluka? Mm -hmm. Synonymous with vampirism or vampires. As this motes dam. That's pretty much literally blood sucker. Uh, later, vampire traditions appear among the European Jews of medieval Rhineland? Yeah, Rhineland. And again, they mentioned Lilith. Mm hmm. Lilith shows uh, up in a lot of that stuff. Yeah. But the whole Lilith thing, the Jewish traditions, the the beliefs, you know, there's like the big three of the Abrahamic religions, and they, you know, so the Hebrews, and then we have like modern Christianity that we know as today, and the Muslim and stuff came from, they all came from the same roots. And so that's why we keep seeing things like Lilith pop up, because all of these legends have been passed down, and even though 
all those tribes spread out and branched out over the millennia, they still kept some of those stories with them. Like, this is this is a demon. This is what, you know, if, if a woman doesn't behave herself, she's going to turn into a demon. You know, that kind of crazy stuff. So... Jewish tradition, Lilith can transform herself into an animal, like a cat or something, or a bat. And she can charm her victims into believing that she's benevolent or irresistible. So she has some of the same aspects as, say, like a succubus, where she would seduce people and then get them into a very vulnerable state before she would attack them and eat their babies. So, so this is kind of ironic when I search the images of Moroi. Those are yeah. Romanian vampires. It appears photos from the teenage film Vampire Academy. God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was a classic movie right there. Oh, oh boy. That's a, jo- a joke. A joke to vampires very much. Yeah, a lot of modern movies are just ridiculous when it comes to vampires. They're not, they're not monsters anymore. They're just people that are very charming and do stuff. Before we got on that tangent, I was going to say one more thing about Jewish folklore and Lilith. Uh-huh. And that was that instead of drinking their blood, they believed that Lilith and her daughters just strangled people. They choked them to death. So that's a little different. Uh-huh. Strange. And it might be a cultural thing, you know, like that reflects a cultural fear that they had that other countries didn't have for various reasons. So we talked a little bit about Romania and the Moroi and the Strigoi, which... Kind of sounds like the Strix or the Striges from Greece. Just the word itself kind of is spelled similar. But the Strigoi in Romania, they are living witches with two hearts or two souls. Or sometimes they had both of them. Like, so they had two hearts and two souls. I've never heard that before, but okay. The Strigoi would be able to send out one of their souls at night to meet with the other Strigoi, other witches and things. And they would eat the blood of the livestock and their neighbors. And once a, a Strigoi died... They became a reanimated corpse that would continue to suck blood and attack living. And they, they have some other urban legend kind of things where they think not just being attacked by a moroi, but if you were born with some sort of weird extra body part, you were doomed to be a vampire. So say you were born with a call on your face or you had an extra nibble or a tail or hair in the wrong spot or whatever, you were going to become a vampire when you die. So there was a lot of superstition around mutations in their children. Like, you know, that's a sign of evil, which is too bad because. As we know now, these things just happen. Some genes get crossed when, when the baby is being made, and that's just, just the way they are. But back then, it was like, oh, no, you're evil. Apparently, the same thing if, you, if the mother of, of a child encounter a black cat crossing her path. Mm-hmm. Weird, but okay, superstition. Yeah, there's a lot of superstition around black cats. We could, we could talk about that. There's a whole bunch we could talk about in just one episode alone about black cats and and how they really have a bad reputation. Like in some of the myths we already talked about, people believe certain demonic entities could turn into cats. So they thought that they were turning into black cats because black was always seen as a symbol, you know, like just the color itself was looked at as like a symbol of death. Apparently people who died before they were baptized could, could turn into a, a strigoi too. Yeah, and say if you committed suicide, you could turn into one too. There was a whole bunch. The, the Romani were very superstitious. Okay, and, and this is pretty much cliche. A person with red hair and blue eyes hmm. could be seen uh, as a, pot- a potential street going. Interesting. Hey! See, and, and you know, red hair is a mutation. I have red hair, so I'm, I should be an X-Men because I'm a mutant. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, red hair and blue eyes is very rare. It typically does not happen. So this is a person that looks highly unusual especially to the Romani because they were most of them had very dark hair and and dark brown eyes like that was just what they looked like and then you get this person that has red hair and blue eyes and it's just like well where did you come from you you don't belong here what's going on so you must be evil because you don't fit how everyone else is yeah uh before I before you talk about the Celtic I'll talk about the Spain okay in Spain, there are several traditions about beings with vampire tendencies, okay, vampiric tendencies. Mm-hmm. In Asturias, highlights the Guasa. Let's see if I can find a Guasa. No, it's not guacamole. <laughs> oh, my God. Okay, I found it. My God, this looks terrifying. Again, the Guasa, okay. Let's see. 
I hope this is the right one. Okay, it wasn't. So what, the, oh, what else does it say? Uh, it's described as an old vampire who sticks his single tooth and sucks the blood of its victims. Mm -hmm. Cantabria equivalent exists in the name Guajona. Guajona, let's see. Guajona. A block sucking creature of Cantabrian legends. Is, uh, this, it resembles a um, disfigured human female. Uh, resembling to an extent the witches and hacks of uh, medieval European folklore, which features uh, with features specific to her feeding habits, covered from head to toe in black in a black cloak, her hands and feet are narrow bird legs, her face is yellow with consumed rod and hairy warts, her eyes are tiny and bright as stars. Aquiline nose and mouth, provided with a single black razor sharp tooth, is so long it reached down to her under chin and used to suck blood, okay. and only comes out at night. Okay, so they describe her as having a lot of bird-like features, like bird legs, and the aquiline nose is a beak-like nose. It's a common, like, if you look at a Roman bust and you see the nose that is very prominent on their face, that's an aquiline nose. That's interesting. There are some other legends over in Europe about witches and stuff having bird legs. So th I can see, you know, there's that connection. I don't know if it's like a subconscious thing or, or something else, but they give vampires and witches like animal body parts. <laughs> but yeah, hey, this, is, this is ironic. So Catalonia, the legend of the dip, a uh, evil vampire dog. Vampire dog. A vampire dog. <laughs> Uh, in the Canary Islands, uh, there was a belief in va vampiric beings in the form of a blood sucking witch. One example is provided by the legend of the Witches of Anaga in Tenerife. Let's see, Witches of Anaga, let's see if I can find something. Mm, no, yeah, uh, just photos of, of the place, pretty much. No. Okay. Uh, let's see if I can find a dip. Tip, okay, is an evil, black, hairy dog that sucks some people's blood. He's lame in one leg. Mm, let's see if I can find Tip. And it's the only time I think I heard of a vampire dog. I mean, I've heard of monster dogs. Oh my god, really? <laughs> uh, I, I put Tip vampire and pretty much his photos of, of, of Tip. <laughs> like, poop Tip. God. <laughs> Mixing. Uh, the vampire dog? Yeah, let's see if I can it, see if is I can it, Is it one. spelled D-I-P? Like, like dip? Like chip dip? Ah, oh, I found one photo! Just one photo. Yeah. There's only like one photo and it's like, uh, uh, oh my god, really? I cannot see the photo? Okay. Okay, here, sharing it is it, pretty much a drawing, a drawing of, of, of the dog. There's no photos or anything. Because uh, the others are dogs making weird faces. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I see that. Yeah, he's got like a red glowing eye. Looks pretty scary. I did a quick search, and Dip is also mentioned as like a hellhound, which is a supernatural dog. There's the hellhounds, supernatural dogs in folklore. So this is a vampire dog, but sometimes they just consider him a hellhound instead. And they usually have like mangy black fur, glowing red eyes. They can be really strong or really fast. And some sort of, they have some sort of ghost or phantom characteristics and they smell bad. Sometimes they're an omen of death if you see them. Or they are considered to be guardians of like the world of the dead, you know, like the gates to the world of the dead. And they might be spotted at graveyards or cemeteries. So some of them have tasks like they hunt lost souls or they guard a supernatural treasure or things like that. But in this case, I think it's just a vampire dog. Like it's just an evil demon dog that like it sucks a lot of people and stuff. So, Maybe there's a legend somewhere that someone knows of that they can share with us about Dip. About maybe, you know, like, it's a person that turned into a dog. Or, you know, because they have, like, the witches and stuff that can transform into other animals. And, like, that's that's another thing with vampires. Like, some there's, there's like, that, that running theme of it's not just a person that's undead that is eating people's souls or blood. They can also turn into animals and things. So they, they're very transformative. 
up before you start with the, the Celtic uh, vampires, I found a photo of the Bowman Stiff. Oh, the, the Bowman She. Yes. Yeah. It's a, that word is not pronounced how it's written because it's Gaelic. In Gaelic, it has really strange um, enunciations of things. Actually, now that I look at it, the Bowman She, I'm not even saying that right. It's just Banshee. <laughs> you don't pronounce half of that word. So that's my bad. Um, I apologize for that. Let's see here. Yeah, there's just like a lot of pictures of like the Banshee. The Banshee, you have the Lian and Shi that are fairy spirits that are that have vampiric tendencies. So a lot of them are like women with red hair that seduce men off the side of the road at night and suck their blood. They don't actually have a lot here, but the Lian and Shi is, is basically a vampire fairy. They can make other vampire fairies. They can make more of, the, of their kind if they attack people. And they can spread the curse more. And some of these myths and stuff influenced writers like Sheridan Le Fanu, who wrote Camilla, which is a very famous classic vampire tale about a female vampire that goes and insinuates herself into a household that's very well-to-do and falls in love with the, the girl that lives there. And, and vice versa, the girl falls in love with her and she seduces her and all that kind of stuff. And then they figure out she's a vampire and it goes bonkers crazy at the end. And then, of course, there's Bram Stoker, who is from the same area and grew up hearing stories about the, the vampire fairies and things. And, um, of course, everyone knows Bram Stoker because he wrote Dracula. And Dracula is probably the most famous, well-known vampire tale across the world. Everybody knows who Dracula is. I mean, like, Dracula was based on a real person. It was uh, Vlad the Impaler. He was the Prince of Wallachia and a member of the House of Draculisti. And it was known as Vlad Draculia or Vlad Dracula. He ruled from 1456 to 1462. And he fought off the Ottomans when they were trying to conquer the, the Balkans. And so he's, he's revered both in Romania and Bulgaria for protecting the region from the Ottomans, which were pretty fierce warriors themselves. And he made a point of having a lot of his enemies impaled in front of his castle. He did it specifically to scare people off and to drive them away. So he did a lot of really crazy things that are pretty horrifying. Like, if you're impaled, they don't do that when you're dead. They do that when you're alive. You get sit down on a, a pike on a spike with a, a sharp end and it goes up your insides and through and you slowly slide down it and you slowly die from that. It's not a nice thing at all. And from that, like Graham, Graham Stoker and some other people learned about his legends and because of his reputation for cruelty, somewhere along the lines, he became known as a vampire just because he was so evil and demonic. Apparently in Germany, there were some pamphlets printed up about him in um, like 1521, they give him a descriptor like he roasted children and he fed them to their mothers or he cut off the breasts of women and forced their husbands to eat them and then he impaled them and things like that. So you have like baby eating, which is associated with vampires, right? So then it's like, okay, so he must be a vampire. And they kind of went from there. So all these, these stories and people kept like adding to them and you know how the rumors and stuff, how people love to talk about urban legends and my brother, my brother, my sister saw this guy do this, and now he's a vampire kind of thing. So from that, and then from uh, Bram Stoker and stuff, he became a very iconic vampire in pop culture. So that's my tangent on Dracula. Hey, I, I, I found some pics of the the a Beardu. I think it looks called like that Beardu. A beautiful young woman that commits suicide when forced into marriage, and then rises from her grave to seek revenge by killing her father and husband. Mm. Okay, so yeah, they're sharing the, the photos and fun. Oh, the deer do? Okay, yeah, that looks like a lot of like pictures of the Leanne and she and that, where it's a very beautiful, seductive woman that's with the fangs and she's going to come and distract you and then bite your back and all that kind of stuff. In southern Russia, here's an interesting one, people who are known to talk to themselves were believed at being risk of becoming vampires. Slavic vampires could appear as butterflies. Butterflies are one of the ones, just like dragonflies, where people thought that they were a symbol of a departed soul. So if you see one, someone who died is saying hello or thinking of you, or the same thing with like sparrows and stuff. There were some urban legends or, or some folklore about living vampires, and again, we know people with two souls. There was a cholera epidemic in the 19th century, 
Um, there was a lot of people that were accidentally buried alive by their neighbors because they thought that they were vampires and they were making people sick and people were dying all over the place. And they were, they were trying to find something to blame. What caused all of this to happen? Oh, it has to be the vampires. It's not, you know, our bad plumbing system or, or lack thereof or, or our inability to, you know, wash our hands all the time and stay clean. It's, it's the vampires. And you'll, you'll find um, stories like that happen a lot. And they just didn't blame them on vampires. They blamed them on a whole bunch of stuff. Like, you know, the witch trials. They were trying to find a reason for why all this stuff happened. And obviously it's supernatural. It's not scientific. You know, it's, it's just all a supernatural cause for big diseases and stuff. Because they just... Uh. Yeah. Since we're talking about Slavic folklore and vampires... They think a vampire goes through several distinct stages of development. In the first 40 days of you becoming a vampire, the vampire starts out as some sort of invisible shadow, and then it gains strength from drinking blood and becomes some sort of like jelly, boneless mass, and eventually, from sucking blood and stuff, eventually makes its own body, which is nearly identical to the person that they had when they were alive. So they leave the grave, the second soul, the bad soul, the vampire soul, leaves the grave and goes out, you can't see it because it's an invisible shadow and it starts attacking people and sucking their blood until it can reform its body and start a new life posing as a human. And according to them, a vampire is usually male in the Slavic folklore as opposed to female in some of the other ones we talked about. Isn't there some Colombian folklore about vampires? Mm, let's see, I found some South American vampires. I see if there's one from here. Let's see. South American vampires, let's see. Pa, pa, pa. Okay, so here's one from Brazil called the Aseman. Uh, the Aseman. Aseman or Aseman? Oh, I don't know how to call it. <laughs> the Aseman can transform into a bat. And according to some myths, the Aseman can shape shift into many creatures. The Aseman vampire is a living vampire that is described as a woman. It's a, it's a female. Mm -hmm. A female vampire. She can walk during the day and is not distinguishable from humans. And at night she becomes a blood-sucking creature. The South American myths about the Aseman says that the vampire is obsessed with counting, much like European vampires. Mm -hmm. You can protect yourself by placing a broom across your door so the Aseman will have to count the bristles before entering. Apparently throwing seeds outside doors and windows will also delay the Aseman from entering the home. And if you scatter enough seeds, the Aseman will be preoccupied until sunrise when it will return to a human female, revealing the identity of the Aseman. If the living vampire is killed in its human form, the Aseman is also killed. Hmm. In weird legs. The thing you said about distracting the vampire, that is a big one in China too, where they believe if you're followed by a vampire or you think you're going to be attacked by one, you grab a big bag of rice and you just toss it on the floor, and they are compelled to stop and count every single grain of rice, and you can get away to safety. You can escape. So that's a, an interesting parallel myth there, like the, the concept of you know, they have to count whatever. Yeah, I found. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, they have to count the, the seeds. Like, mm -hmm. Yeah, like I mentioned. Yeah. And I don't know what kind of room you would have to put in the door so the vampire would have, would have to be all night there, pretty much. Those brooms were made out of straw. I mean, we're talking about old tiny brooms that people would make themselves. Sometimes they'd use sticks and stuff so they could find things, ones that were thin enough and could bend, you know, like they were flexible. But most of the time it was just straw. So the one I found is called the Tunda. Okay. Uh, it's a vampire-like doppelganger monster woman. It's a myth of the Pacific coastal region of Colombia and Ecuador, and particularly the Afro-American community of the Choco Department. It's a shape-shifting entity that resembles a human female that lures people into the forest and keeps them there. It is capable to change its shape to appear in the form of a loved one and seeing the likeness of a child's mother to would lure its victims into the forest and feed, with, feed it with, with trims to keep it docile. This is called entundamiento, and a person in this state is entundado. Her shape-shifting abilities are said to be imperfect, as this doppelganger of sorts would always have a wooden left in the shape of a molinillo 
or a wooden kitchen utensil used to stir hot drinks such as chocolate or agua panela. The monster is very cunning when trying to hide this defect from its would be victims. In other versions, it appears to male or make uh, loggers or hunters. I, I guess it's lore. Lore, yeah. loggers or hunters working deep into the jungle as a beautiful woman that tries to lure a man away. So I can reveal its hideous nature and suck his blood or devour him as a wild animal. Hmm. It kind of reminds me of Jennifer's Body, the, the, that horrible film with, with Megan Fox. Yeah, <laughs> the bad one. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, there's a lot of seduction going on with these horrible things, driving people crazy or just eating them. Okay, here's one from the Philippines. It's okay. called Aswan. Aswan, I think. Aswan. Aswang? It's an Aswan, yeah. Or Aswan. Yeah, Aswang with a G at the end. Yeah. Is another shape shifter pretty much. Possesses a combination of the traits of a vampire, a ghoul, uh, and a warlock, witch, or different species of werebees in Philippine in Filipino folklore, or even all of them at the same time. Okay, but yeah, Spanish if the colonists noted that the Aswang was the most feared among the mythical creatures of the Philippines, even in the 16th century. Mm-hmm. And the myth is known throughout the Philippines. Other names for the creature are Tic Tic, Fifi, Bayo, Wak Wak, Sok Sok, and Kling Kling. Sometimes this creature is called the Balbal or Bull, replaces the cadaver with banana tree trunks after consumption. Oh. As one, it Stories and definitions vary from region to region, person to person. There's no set of characteristics that can be ascribed to them. The term is used interchangeably with mananangal. Man- mananangal. Also, mananangal. Yeah. Mananangal. Well, That's hard to say. A vampire like mythical creature of the Philippines, a malevolent, man eating, and block sucking monster or witch. Yeah, this is one where um, there's like movies of it. And basically the head or like just the upper torso will remove from the body and fly around at night and then go attack pregnant ladies and essentially stick their tongues in them and then suck out their fetuses and eat them. It's pretty awful stuff, which might be, you know, some maybe that's a way that they tried to just explain when someone miscarries. Like, oh, it was the vampire attacked you and that's why you lost your baby. Well, I share uh, some pics from a movie that had something like that. I don't know if it's the same thing. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's one of those, I was thinking it was, it's called Mystics in Bali. And it's just a, a flying head, as a vampire woman head, and then there's just like entrails sticking down from the neck. <laughs> it is bizarre. I, I was seeing some footage of it, and the movie looks absolutely hysterical. We should watch it sometime. <laughs> yeah. Um, the Chinese vampires are pretty strange. They have the jumping vampires. And Um, I think there's a movie about jumping vampires. There there are many movies about jumping vampires. Most of them I know of, they started making them in the 1970s and then up until present day. um, Where they'd hop around and then they'd make more followers, more vampires, and then so there's this big group of like vampires are just jumping and then going towards people. Which to us probably sounds pretty funny. Um... (laughs) But, I, 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 apparently, I forgot to mention one. Okay. The Patasola. Okay. Uh, appears in the form of a beautiful and seductive woman, obtaining the likeness of a loved one, lures a man away with his companions deep into the jungle. There, the Patasola reveals her true hideous appearance as a one legged creature with ferocious vampire like loss for human flesh and blood. Attacking and devouring the flesh or sucking the blood of her victims. Ooh, that sounds scary. And yeah, she actually derives from vampire legend. Uh, she inhabits mountain ranges, uh, ranges, virgin forests, and, and other heavily wooded on jungle like areas. Mm-hmm. At the edges of these places, pretty, and mainly at night, she lures male hunters, loggers, miners millers and animal herders. She also interferes with their daily activities. She blocks shortcuts through the jungle, discourages hunters, and throws 
hunting dogs of the extent of their game. The patasola is socially regarded as protective of nature and the forest animals and unforgiving when humans enter their domains to alter or destroy them. Hmm. Apparently, additionally, the exact name and attributes of the meat vary according to region. And like I mentioned, there's a creature similar to La Patasola called La Tunda in the pa Colombian Pacific Coast. I already mentioned that one. Uh, apparently, the Patasola's most notable feature is, well, she only has one leg. Hmm. Uh, the leg, uh, the, this terminates in a cliff-like, cliff bovine, bovine-like hook and moves in a planty great fashion. Despite, the, uh, despite having only one left, the patasola can move swiftly through the jungle. In her natural state, the, the patasola has a terrifying appearance. She is described as possessing one breast, bulking eyes, cat-like fangs, a hook nose, big lips, and tangled hair. Apparently, she takes the form of a beautiful woman to lure men to their death. She uses her feline tight fans to stop the blood from her victims, and it is believed that she can transform into other animals, materializing as a large black dog or cow. So we have and another we have another one where they can transform into animals. Like a cat. The cat keeps coming up. Yeah. Huh. Apparently the origin of the story varies, but usually follows the pattern of a Scorn, unfaithful, or otherwise bad woman. Some believe that she was a mother who killed her own son, was banished to the woods as punishment. Others believe that she was a wicked temptress who was cruel to both men and women, and for this reason they mutilated her with an axe, chopping off one leg and throwing it into a fire. She died of her injuries and haunts the forests and mountain ranges. In a third origin story, she was an unfaithful wife who cheated on her husband with the couple's employer, a patron. Upon discovering her infidelity, the jealous husband mother, okay, murdered mm -hmm. both her and the patron. She died, but her soul remains in a one-legged body. Huh. So it's another like a revenge kind of, like an entity is out to get revenge kind of thing. Okay. A one-legged body, but it has like a cow hoof on the bottom? Is yeah. That? So they have a, a cow foot. But is it, is it a human leg, or is it just a cow leg? Uh, tearing the pigs and let's see. Okay, so it looks like it's a human, a human leg that ends in a cow hoof. In the pictures here. That's pretty scary stuff. So I would assume that she hops along in the woods too, like in the jungles and stuff, because she only has one leg. Uh, okay, so I found the uh, tundra. Okay. Okay. Okay, so these pictures, they this has more like a skeletal face in some of them. It definitely has some like the old witch crone kind of thing going on with the hunchback body and the the scary face and the curved hands and things like that. Yeah, well, we are we are yeah. out of time. We can talk about more vampires in other episodes since there's so many to yeah, cover. There's um, way too many. <laughs> yeah, way too many to cover in just one episode. So we'll do some more vampire episodes later on and that way we can get more into detail about local legends and folklore and things like that. So that is all the time we have for today. Have you seen a vampire? Are you a vampire? Would you believe in one if you saw one? Let us know in the comments below. I am Cassie Carnage and with uh, Weird Musician. Thank you for listening to Miss Vault and we'll talk to you later. Avoid Edward Cullen. Avoid Edward Cullen. <laughs>